Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Decision 84, the decision which, ever way it goes, is going to shape this country's immediate future. Will National and Sir Robert Muldoon be returned for a fourth consecutive term? Will Labour turn the tables and cap off the remarkable seven-year rise in politics of David Longy? Or will Social Credit and the New Zealand Party play their part? To give us the answer, hundreds of polling clerks from Bay of Islands in the north to Aurora in the south have just gone out and locked the doors to the polling places, unlocked the ballot boxes and started counting. The only script for our programme tonight is the one which you've written as you cast your votes. Our first priority, of course, is to bring you the results, but we're also geared up right round the country to be with the people to whom the results mean a personal triumph or a personal tragedy. Colin James will be watching for straws in the wind, which will give us an early indication of the way vital marginal seats are likely to go. Colin, before the first figures do start coming in, can we look at why we're having the first snap election in more than 30 years? Sir Robert said that he couldn't battle on with questionable backbench support. Is that likely to have been the full or at least the real reason? Well, I don't think it's the only reason, and I'm not sure that, that it's the real reason. Uh, Marilyn Wearing, who withdrew from the caucus and uh, who was uh, the basis on which he made that statement, said that she would support the government uh, on procedural matters and on substantive matters, uh, which would have given it uh, a working majority uh, for some time into the future. Uh, the only two that she reserved her position on were nuclear arms, where the government had a majority anyway, and rape reform, which is hardly a matter of confidence. So I think we have to look at uh, other matters. Uh, and I think the economy uh, is really the key. The figures in the economy were likely to get worse between now and November, uh, and uh, I think that was demonstrated during the campaign. The balance of payments situation worsened, the uh, consumer price index worsened. So he was, uh, I think, uh, taking an opportunity to go to the country uh, be when the figures were relatively good. Would uh, Sir Robert have preferred to have found a different issue to go to the country on? I think he would have rather had, as any Prime Minister would, uh, especially calling a snap election, a strong issue to go to the country on as the uh, Holland government had in 1951 when it went to the country after the waterfront strike. Is there, in fact, any similarity between the 51 situation and what we see today? I don't think a great deal, apart from the fact that it is a snap election and that it is in the winter. Uh, in 1951, there was a new government in, in office not much more than 18 months. Uh, it had been through a six-month uh, stand-up uh, confrontation with the unions, where I think it had had considerable public support. In this case, it's a government uh, just going to the country on its record, just like it would in a general election, really. Uh, the Marsden Point situation never developed into anything like the waterfront strike. Colin James. Well, we may be unsure uh, about just exactly what has triggered this election, but there's no doubt that it's created an enormous amount of work for an enormous range of people, the sudden rush to complete the electoral rolls, for example. The political party parties themselves have worked virtually around the clock since that late-night announcement four weeks ago. An awful lot of the load has fallen on the party presidents, the people charged with organising the machinery behind the candidates. People like the National Party's Sue Wood, uh, who's finally reached the National Party's uh, election night headquarters in Wellington. Sue Wood, welcome to Decision 84. It must have been a pretty tough three weeks for you. Yes, it has been, and for a lot of other people too, who've been doing so much hard work. You're here in Wellington tonight to, uh, to see the election night results. You actually come from Auckland. How often have you been in Auckland over the last three weeks? I've been dashing home in weekends to see my family, but I've been based here for the month. Who's looking after them, Sue? They're right here tonight. <laughs> They're with you? The whole yes, family's there? they are indeed, yes. yes. What exactly happens uh, on election night in National Party headquarters? I've never been privy to that, but, uh, you know, is it a bit of a party or are you all standing by with pencils and papers? We're standing by with pencils and papers and television sets and radios like most of New Zealand. Tell us a little bit about the, uh, the people who've been working the campaign and the people who've been working today. Just exactly what's the party organisation been up to today, for instance? Our organisation has been based on 95 electorates throughout the country. For head headquarters itself... Nothing's been happening here because obviously the focus on election day is getting those voters out. What exactly uh, do you do tomorrow, Sue? Have you got any plans for that? I think that um, you and your friends have got me quite busy tomorrow. I'm booked up already. <laughs> Prediction tonight, would you like to, to take a shot in the dark? No, I won't take a shot in the dark, actually. I've said for two years this is going to be a very close election, and that's as far as I'll go to predict it. Sue Wood, thank you very much for joining us on Decision 84. Whatever happens tonight, I hope it's an enjoyable evening for thank you. Thank you very much. 
for the Labour Party an added complication has been the fact that Jim Anderton didn't have time to hand over the party presidency before having to uh, fight the election as the candidate for Sydenham. Uh, Jim Anderton's at the Christchurch Labour headquarters at the moment, uh, the election night headquarters. Uh, Mr Anderton, um, how's it been trying to be both party president and a candidate? Well, I must say a little uh, exciting and wearing, but um, Mr Muldoon has given us the chance to become the government five months early, and I think we're all buoyed up by that. Would you have preferred to have been just a candidate in this election? Yes, of course. That was always my intention, but Mr Muldoon didn't consult me when he uh, called the general election, and uh, I wasn't expecting to be consulted by him, I must admit. Tell me, um, would you uh, feel that your campaign in Sydenham has been in any way damaged by the fact you've had to look after party organisation? I've had a magnificent organisation in Sydenham and the people in Christchurch in general um, are very friendly and hard-working people and with their support we're going to get a crushing victory in Sydenham tonight. Well, what's been the basis of, uh, of Labor's work during the last three weeks? How have you handled a snap uh, election? Well, of course, we've been working on the basis that there could be an early election ever since the last general election in 1981. The government, in effect, has only had a majority of one for all that time. So we've had a campaign committee which I've chaired. It's been in operation for 18 months. We've had contingency plans for by-elections and for a snap election. So really the Labor Party's been like a well-oiled machine, and if any political party in modern times in New Zealand has been prepared and managed to deliver a political vote of uh, mammoth proportions, this one has. Well, one final question. Any prediction for tonight? I think if the mood of the country is I, as I have found it over the last few weeks, there will be a substantial victory for Labour. If that mood isn't there, then it will be close, but I think Labour will win anyway. Mr Anderton, thanks. I suspect if there is a substantial swing to Labour that things will be a lot uh, noisier down there than they are at the moment in Christchurch. OK, to the results. Uh, how do we get them and how do we show them to you? Now, you may just be inclined to think sitting at home there that uh, it's just me and Fred and Colin uh, doing all the work. Well, much as I'd like to be able to pretend that two Marlborough College old boys like Fred and myself can hack the pace by ourselves, that, of course, is not the case. We need a lot of help. In fact, all the work is done out in the electorates and behind us here. Uh, you can see that there's a whole raft of people all at the ready. Our results reporter in each electorate rings in here as soon as the result's known. The computer operators put the result directly into our borough's computer, and that process takes less than a minute. And the result is then immediately available to show you. We'll be concentrating on bringing you the results just as quickly as possible. And here's how you'll see the results. The first information, of course, uh, is going to be progresses in the early part of the evening. We'll be bringing you quite a few of those so you can judge how the critical electorates are moving. Um, this uh, information that we're going to have a look at now is uh, going to be just a dummy. Uh, we don't really, of course, have any figures in yet. Uh, now, you see that there's a band of colour across the top. That tells you which party is leading in the seat at this stage. Uh, we also tell you how much of the estimated vote has been counted so that you know whether candidates who are lagging still have much chance of catching up. Now, all through the evening, we're going to be listing the candidates in order of the votes they've received. So whoever's on top of the list is in front at that stage. And if there's a name in capitals, such as Mr Cox in Manawatu, at this, uh, the one we're looking at now, then that's a sitting MP. But remember, because of the boundary changes, some MPs find themselves in seats which, on, on paper at least, another party holds. But uh, we'll be talking about those cases a little later. Um, eventually, the progress results will start giving way to finals. And the first thing we'll show you when a final comes through is a map so that you can see whereabouts in the country uh, the electorate is. And a number of electorates, of course, have had changed boundaries or have had their names changed. After the map, we'll be seeing the result itself. Again, these are just dummy figures at this stage, uh, much the same as a progress result. Again, the coloured band at the top tells you the party that's won the seat. Candidates' names will be in order of success from the top. And further down in this case, there's the majority for the <coughs> successful candidate, uh, um, an election night majority, of course, and the swing in that particular seat. And you ain't seen nothing yet, folks. Still lots to show you. Uh, during the course of Decision 84, we'll be joined in the studio by a number of uh, distinguished guests representing all the four main political parties, and we'll be talking to them. We've also still got to show you the uh, computer predictions. Uh, we'll be taking a look at the first of our uh, progress results coming through, and we'll be looking at the locations where the party leaders uh, wait out the night of Decision 84. All of that after this commercial break. Sir? 
Just how super is Super Supreme? It has beef, pepperoni, pork, capsicum, sliced ham, onions, Just olives, pepper. mushrooms, and pineapple. Wow. Beef, pepperoni, pork, capsicum, sliced ham, onions, olives, mushroom, and pineapple? You need two pizzas to hold all that. If you want the lot, we'll give you the works. Super Supreme, Pizza Hut Super Pizza. Mm, super. Super Supreme. It has beef, pepperoni, pork. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Capsicum, sliced thank ham. You. You're welcome. Onions, olives, <laughs> mushrooms, and pineapple. Super Supreme. The works. You can always listen to your old Uncle Pete. Now, look, I tell you, lad, you can't miss on lightning fast in the fifth. And, of course, the boss always has some definite ideas. Troy beans, Watson. That's where I made my money. In 44. And there's always dear old Aunt Tilda. I told you a thousand times, Angie. Marry a rich man. Auntie. Or you can go with the smart money and open a countrywide money works account. Let's face it. It's hard enough to save a dollar these days, and you want your money to work even harder than you do. The Countrywide Money Works account earns you a hard-working 9% from your first dollar. That's 9% per annum on call for everyday savings and lump sum savings. Best of all, there are hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash prizes. That's right, every Thursday of every week is Cash Thursday, the day you get the chance to double your savings up to a whopping $10,000. With Money Works, Countrywide's put the fun back into saving for everyone. Right, Uncle Pete? Those extra touches that have made business class such a success have come down to earth. The most important extra is individual service and attention for the busy executive. It's made business class a totally new standard of service, complete with a special class of car with an AM, FM stereo cassette player. So next time you travel, experience service that's in a class of its own. Avis Business Class. From the world's finest beans comes New Zealand's favourite coffee. Well, a bit different. I can, and so can you, with Maggie Cook in the pot. Look at all these famous dishes. Tonight, I'm cooking chicken provencal. It's so easy, because Cook in the Pot has exactly the right blend of herbs and spices that you need to create these wonderful, authentic dishes. Mmm, Maggie Cook in the Pot. A deliciously simple way to serve something different. Welcome back to Decision 84. One of the unusual side effects of the speed with which Sir Robert Muldoon called the snap election was that retiring MPs were robbed, or spared, depending on whichever way you look at it, of the traditional parliamentary farewells. One of those, of course, was the last Labour Prime Minister, Sir Wallace Rowling, and he's with us here in the studio tonight. Sir Wallace, what does it feel like to be watching an election night and not actually being involved? Well, there's a little less tension, but it's, it's a very exciting election night for me because I think that... Uh, a lot of work that I've been involved with, with many other people, is actually going to bear fruit this evening. I it was it... 22 years ago to the day that you won your first election, wasn't it? Yes, quite coincidentally. Uh, Bull by election 1962. You're obviously going to be watching tonight's results very keenly, and none more so than your old seat, uh, and I assume that you expect uh, uh, Ken Shirley to win that. But if there's one seat that you'd like to pick out to watch tonight that is of particular interest to you, what would it be? I think it depends on whether you're looking at a, um, a provincial or... Um, or a city, or an urban seat. But I'd, I'd, I'd look at a seat like Glenfield, I think, in Auckland, uh, one of the new seats. Uh, All right. Now, you were robbed of making your farewell speech to the House, but I understand that you'd had it sort of drafted. What were you going to say? No, no, that's, not, that's, that, that's another myth, I think. Yeah. <laughs> what would you have said then? Oh, well, that's something that... Uh, I don't know that people will ever really know. Uh, OK. One final question. Uh, one of the abiding memories of uh, last uh, election was of you being carried into your party headquarters in Nelson on the shoulders of your supporters. I, I don't know whether you're a betting man or not, but what sort of odds are you offering on David Longy getting the same sort of treatment in Mungaroo? <laughs> well, he's got some pretty strong supporters up there, and it may well be in the excitement of the moment they're only too prepared to lift him aloft. We'll see as the evening wears on. All right, Sir Wallace, thank you for joining us. We look forward to talking to you again later in the evening. Thank you. 
With the new boundaries, we have 95 seats in the new Parliament. That's three more than in the old one. To fit in the extra three, quite a lot of the old seats have had to have their boundaries changed around. And, uh, Colin, James, that means problems for a few MPs, doesn't it? Well, two in particular start off on paper behind tonight. That's Dale Jones in West Auckland, whose old Helensville seat has lost a chunk of rural territory to the north, which was national supporting. Uh, and he starts off on paper 417 votes behind on election night figures. And the other is Bob Bell in Gisborne, where the Kaiti area to the east of Gisborne City uh, was in the old East Cape electorate. That's been put, the Gisborne City has been put back together. It's a little more urban, ele urban electorate than it was. Uh, and he's behind on paper by 856 votes on election night figures in 81. The uh, main changes have been in the northern and southern fringes of Auckland. Uh, then in central uh, North Island, where the old Topo seat has been divided between Tongariro and Waikato Moana, and uh, Roger McClay, the MP for Topo, has shift shifted. He stayed with the town of Topo, but he now has an electorate which stretches away to the southwest, right down to the outskirts of, of Napier and Hastings, the Waikato Moana seat. The other main change is around Dunedin, where Clutha has uh, ceased to be a marginal seat, is now a wholly rural seat, took, also, took in a chunk of Awarua, lost a chunk of... Uh, Mosgiel to Dunedin, and then everything moved round in Dunedin, and uh, Port Chalmers went to Otago, making that a, a rather less safe seat. So uh, what situation do we start the evening in? If we take all the 81 uh, votes and redistribute it over the new seats of the new boundaries, what would be the theoretical state of the parties right now? Well, on paper, it's National 47, Labour 46, Social Credit 2. So National has one seat majority or plurality over Labour. That makes it a very tight race to begin with. Uh, and that means that in 1981, had the 1981 election been held on these boundaries, there would have been uh, what is colloquially known as a hung parliament, a minority thanks. government. So with uh, 95 seats in the new parliament, a uh, party needs to win 48 seats tonight to be able to form the government. Uh, we'll be showing that race through the next few hours on this chart. As each final is declared, a band of colour gets added to the track of the successful party. The first party to hit that 48-seat line is the government. The more seats they have over that line, the more comfortable their majority. Remember, though, that many Labour seats declare quickly, so the early leader might not necessarily be the eventual winner. Long before we reach that stage, however, we're going to be sticking our necks out and making some predictions. So Colin, how do we do this? Well, we selected 200 polling places throughout the country in 30 critical electorates. Uh, and our reporters are in the field in those electorates. We'll be sending in those votes uh, as soon as they come in for those, those uh, polling booths. And uh, we have statistician Hugh Morton of Massey University with me tonight. And he's developed a computer prediction system which takes those votes uh, and forecasts a result for each of those seats. And then from those seats builds up a national picture. Thanks, Colin. So our computer, once it uh, has enough information to make a prediction about a seat, uh, we're going to be showing you uh, that as a prediction by us on the night. It won't, of course, indicate that uh, that seat has yet fallen. It's our prediction. It'll tell you whether the important marginal seats are likely to be held or lost. Uh, of course, Tamaki, in this particular instance, is not a marginal, but it's just to show you uh, how the uh, predictions will look. Um, Colin, what seats are in fact going to tell us uh, which way the election's going well, tonight? Watch uh, tonight uh, three groups of seats. Uh, there's a group which the government has to hold if it's going to uh, have any real show of remaining the government. Uh, and those start off uh, with uh, Miramar and West Auckland, for instance. We've selected 12 of our 30 electorates, which we suggest you watch very closely tonight. Miramar and West Auckland, which are Labour-held, uh, Miramar by 691 votes on election night, West Auckland by 416 on election night, and then two social credit seats, Rangatiki and East Coast Bays, 513 and 295. Now, if National holds one of those, then that's going to make it difficult. Uh, it, there's, there's going to be a reasonable chance that uh, National might stay in power. If it holds two or more, uh, then uh, it's going to make it that much more difficult for Labour to form a government. I would suggest you watch also Gisborne during the night. Now then, that line that's under East Coast Bay, that represents the position as it now is. And we move across that line to three seats which are highly marginal, held by National. Eden, Waitaki and Horafenua. Eden with just 153 votes on election night to National. Uh, Waitaki with just 229. Horafenua with 777. And then, if you're looking at the possibility... Uh, of, a, of a definite Labour government, you'll find it by watching these five seats. If any or several of these seats fall, then it is likely that there will be a, a Labour government tonight. And these are Fendleton, 
Hamilton West, the two Hamilton seats, Ohario, where Bob Jones is standing for the New Zealand Party, and New Plymouth, which was the early indicator in 1975. And the range of uh, majorities there, the paper majorities, on election night figures between 1,200 and 1,500, that's 3.5% to 4.5% swing required. And then if you, want, if, if you want a further indication, look at seats like Invercargill, Awarua, Whangarei, and seats like that. If those are falling, then there's going to be a Labour government. Those, of course, then, are the seats for you to keep an eye on tonight. We'll be looking at them regularly for you during the evening, and we'll also be predicting the final state of the parties, but, of course, that's going to be just a little later. And indeed, while uh, Colin and Fred have been talking to you, we've had our first progress in here uh, at the uh, Decision 84 headquarters. It comes from Hawke's Bay. It's a progress result, uh, a progress uh, score with only 3% of the uh, estimated vote counted, so it's not too meaningful at the moment, where Sir Richard Harrison, the Speaker of the House, uh, is just leading uh, Bill Sutton, the Labour Party candidate there. But only 3% of the vote counted, not too significant at this stage of proceedings. In fact, we've got another progress and we're going to Palmerston North, uh, where the la sitting Labour member, Trevor De Clean, uh, is just slightly ahead of uh, his national opponent with only 4%, but that really is, I stress, uh, a, an almost meaningless thing. Just an illustration of the technology that we have available and how quickly we're going to be getting these results to you. OK, Fred and Colin have given you a quick cooked tour around, uh, around the technology we have available and how you'll be seeing the results on the screen. Immediately we receive that information uh, from the uh, 95 vote counting areas around the country. We'll be popping it up on the screen. I bet their anxiety, however, is more than matched by the feelings of the candidates and particularly, of course, by the four party leaders. They traditionally make their appearance late in the evening, but at their various headquarters are our reporters. We're going north now to the first of them, up to Auckland, to Labour Party headquarters in Mungary, and Richard Harmon. David Longy's uh, Mungary electorate have chosen a hall for tonight's, uh, to set up their headquarters in tonight, which is right over the road from Homestead, in which the Prime Minister from 1912 to 1925, William Massey, lived. And they're quietly confident here in Mangari tonight that they're going to provide New Zealand's their second New Zealand Prime Minister. The atmosphere in the hall at the moment is formal, restrained. One of the party workers told us they don't want tonight to turn into a raucous party. David Longy himself, uh, according to tradition, is not in the hall at the moment. He's going to be coming down here when he's got a clear idea of just what the trend is. And when he does come, we understand that he is going to make a formal speech. And if he's winning and he is Prime Minister, that'll be a Prime Ministerial speech. But if he's losing, well, no one round here is talking about that at the moment. So, from David Longy's Mangari electorate headquarters, it's to Fielding and Kevin Ramshaw. And Social Credit have booked a very small hall in Fielding, but that doesn't mean to say that the expectations here are, are small or, or, or little. The people who have been drifting in and out all day have had a mood of, of quiet confidence. There are very few people here at the, at the moment. Most people are going to wait until the leader, Bruce Beetham, arrives around about 8 o'clock, and then I think that the hall will fill up. Uh, there's been interest in, in the way that, that, that results are going to come in, and, and there was a note of... Uh, uh, of uh, confidence from them when the first result came in from uh, Utawai School Hall and there 43 people voted and uh, there was an increase of five for social credit and uh, so people are naturally thinking that perhaps uh, things might go their way at least in this electorate. Uh, there's also um, interest in, in what of course is going to happen in East Coast Bays. Uh, now it's time I think to go to Wellington and to Ted Sheehan at New Zealand Party headquarters in Wellington. Well the New Zealand Party has taken over a cabaret here in Wellington tonight and this party has come here prepared to party. I'm assured that if even one candidate takes a seat for the New Zealand party, the champagne will be broken out and the bills will be thrown away. Of course, of big interest to the party here tonight is Bob Jones' fight in Ahariu. Party officials tell me that an unofficial survey taken in Ahariu just yesterday showed Jones leading, Labour second, and Cabinet Minister Hugh Templeton a distant third. But that's all yet to come. Bob Jones is expected to arrive here to join the other revellers around 9 o'clock tonight. We'll see you then, and now to catch up with what's happening in the rest of the country, here's Fred Cockram at Election Centre. Ted, thanks very much. Um, we have a, a, a difficulty reading our Tamaki OB at the moment. Uh, I'm told that there's been a sporting event up in Auckland and the, uh, the OB's on its way there very rapidly. Uh, we hope it'll be with us shortly when we'll be able to, uh, to see where um, Sir Robert Muldoon is spending the evening, uh, crossing there very shortly, I hope, to, to John Bishop. Um, Colin James, I wonder if at this, uh, this early stage of the evening um, we, can, uh, we can discuss a little bit more about the, uh, the way the boundaries have actually affected people. Um, 
Do you think it had any bearing on the uh, decision of any MPs to stand down, the boundary changes? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, if, if it had had that sort of bearing, then I think Dale Jones and uh, um, uh, Bob Bell would have stood down, and neither of them did. I think the, the MPs who stood down are retiring for genuine reasons. Uh, You've actually been on the road for much of this campaign. Um, is there likely to be an even swing, do you believe, over the country, or are individual MPs likely to be performing better than others? Well, the evidence of the last few elections is that there seems to be a, a growing variation in the swing between uh, electorates. And last uh, election we had it uh, graphically uh, shown to us because some, suites, some seats swung in one direction and others in another direction, which was rather confusing early in the night. Uh, and so I would expect, uh, again, a variation of swing... Uh, during the night between seats. Uh, Colin, thanks. One of the uh, critical marginals, one of the classic marginals, of course, is the Auckland central seat of Eden. And the Eden seat's very often won by only a few votes. In fact, in recent years, it has always been won by the party which has ended the evening able to form a government. Trying to hang on to it for National tonight is the Health Minister, Ozzy Malcolm. Uh, he's in his electorate headquarters at the moment. Uh, Mr Malcolm, uh, no early indications yet from the seat, but you've been on the ground there for the last three weeks or so, shaking hands, knocking on doors. What's your feeling in the Eden seat? My feeling is that uh, Eden's in good shape and that it'll probably come to the government by a fairly small margin. I think there's been a very strong swing back towards the government as the campaign has progressed, as people have seen that uh, the uh, Labour Party doesn't really have the credibility to form a government, and I think things have firmed up very well. That's my reading. Would you like to put any figure on the majority tonight? Uh, I'm personally picking a 500-vote majority here in Eden for National. And how about around the country? Do you think uh, that's going to be reflected in the country as a whole? Well, that's hard for me to judge because I've had my, uh, my nose down and my tail up here in Eden looking after my home patch. How's the family been, uh, been able to cope with this? You're busy as a minister and suddenly flung into a thing like this. You've really had to fight for the seat. You've seen much of your family lately. Uh, well, I've had some of them with me because it's been mid-term break and they've been helping me and very well indeed. Mr Malcolm, thank you very much. We'll be back to Eden as soon as there's some further indication as to the way the seat's likely to go. Still early, of course, for anybody to be uh, entirely happy about what's going on tonight, but uh, they all look very glum at the moment, don't they? We're going to talk now to the second of our studio guests on Decision 84. It's Dorothy McNabb, long-serving Dominion councillor for the National Party, who's flown up here today from a very snowy Otago, I understand. Is that right, Dorothy? That's true, I'm afraid, yes. Yeah, you've, of course, been involved in the National Party movement for a long time. You've just stood down. You made a reputation for being very involved in women's affairs. This election has got an extraordinary number of women candidates uh, standing, and, of course, some of them have to be returned. Well, yes. Well, of course, it pleases me immensely that the women uh, are coming into Parliament, more so. But there's still a long way to go before it would satisfy me that there's anything like uh, equal representation. Well, do you think we can get to that? Um, well, only on merit. I mean, that's, that's the only way I want to see women there, on merit. I suppose you'd be happy with what's happened in America with, uh, with, with Fritz Mondale kicking out. Oh, very. I've already asked a commentator tonight if it's a good sign. Yes. All right. Can I ask you for one seat that you're keeping your eye on tonight, please? Um, yes, well, I was always keep my eye on Cluth. That's my own, where I come from. But the seat I'll be looking for, really, I think, is Gisborne is a seat I particularly want to see the outcome of. All right. Dorothy McNabb, thanks very much. Incidentally, who do you think is going to get Gisborne, or is that a silly question? Uh, no, uh, it's not, not a silly question. It's a very good question. I think Bob Bunnell will get to take it for National. All right, no. smashing. Thank you, Dorothy McNabb. Right. Don't go away, because we're going to want to talk to you later on in the evening. Uh, the progresses are starting to come in now. After the commercial break, we hope to have a prediction or two for you, but we'll be back very shortly. I'll be home soon. Let me talk to Mum. Have you eaten yet? Dad's fixed a great meal. <laughs> he has? <laughs> a meal so good. Kentucky Fried Chicken. So good. Save some for me. A meal so good. So good, and with those wholesome extras, it makes a real meal. It's so good. It's so good. It's bingo looking good. Kentucky Fried Chicken. A meal so good. Smith & Smith stock all the leading brands of wallpaper, Vision, Ashley, House of York, plus an exclusive range of imported paper. And hundreds of specials at Smith & Smith. Thousands and thousands of patterns at Smith & Smith. In fact, we sell more rolls of wallpaper than anybody else in New Zealand. And hundreds of specials at Smith & Smith. 
at every one of our 35 stores. 36 stores nationwide. 35. Can Colgate really help repair tooth decay? Sounds amazing. Ah, we have conclusive proof that Colgate Furigard can actually help repair unseen weak spots. It's the early sign of tooth decay. Look, here's an x-ray photograph of early decay of the enamel. After regular brushing with Colgate Furigard, the weak spot is disappearing. So, Furigard does two things. It helps repair early unseen decay, as well as toughening up teeth against decay. Colgate Fluorigard. Only your dentist or dental nurse can give teeth a better fluoride treatment. Jan Taylor, Miss Australia, 1964. Now mother of three and still looking good. I have to work at it. How? Well, the first thing is a really clean skin. I use soap and water, but it must be a mild soap, so I use palm olive. All the skin-softening goodness of olive oil goes into new palm olive to pamper your skin, to keep it clean and healthy. Sometimes they need scrubbing, but palm olive doesn't irritate their skin because it's so gentle. New palm olive, the skin pamperer. Think of this as information. It could be your company's single most important resource. ICO will help you harness the power of the computer to get your hands on that information. ICO will help you extract from a mass of data exactly what you need. Then ICL's distributed systems will help you pass that information from person to person. ICL will help you put the right information into the hands of the right people just when they need it. ICL. We should be talking to each other. Save yourself time and treat the family by serving convenient, tasty Coleman self-sourcing spongy puds. Coleman spongy puds. Delishimo, as always. The Westpac Advantage Saver account gives you more than the usual handful of benefits. Because at Westpac, we're rolling our sleeves up to bring you better banking services. Welcome back to Decision 84. In fact, we have a progress from uh, Taranaki uh, with just 2% of the vote counted there. Uh, national leading. Uh, that's really, as I say, almost so insignificant it's difficult to say anything about it. But um, This, of course, is a seat where one of the uh, sitting national cabinet ministers has resigned. Uh, Mr Thompson resigned here and uh, Mr Maxwell there seems to, as though he's going to hold on to the seat for national. Of course, we have to say at this very early stage of the evening, very, very small percentages of the vote counted and we have no idea at this stage, of course, what sort of polling booths those results are coming from. OK, great. Uh, well, we showed you that just to show you that we are, in fact, getting the results to you as quickly as possible. At this stage of the evening, the only real indication of how things might go is contained in the uh, public opinion polls, such as those conducted by Eyewitness News during the year. Of course, they don't measure or even predict what you, the voters, have done today, but the polls do give some indication of shifts in public opinion. From the 1981 election, the two major parties stayed more or less locked together for a year. They swapped positions last year, and this year Labour held a 7% lead the day after the snap election was announced. Social credit steadily lost ground. The New Zealand party started spectacularly, but slipped back. A week into the campaign, and Halen's polled three critical electorates. In East Coast Bays, Social Credit and Gary Knapp took a hammering, and National took a handy lead. In Ahariu, where Bob Jones lined up against National's Hugh Templeton, the poll three weeks ago showed Labour were well ahead of National. Bob Jones not really in the race, and the social credit vote had collapsed. And finally, in Eden, a similar picture with Labour well ahead of National's Aussie Malcolm, and neither Socred uh, nor the New Zealand Party playing any sort of part. So just exactly what do these public opinion polls tell us? We've got uh, political scientist Rod Alley in the studio. Rod, welcome along to Decision 84. What are public opinion polls really trying to do? Well, I think when you talked about a shift and a trend, you put your finger on it, Rodney. It's a very important part of what polls can do for us. Over a period of time, they can indicate a trend in the movement of opinion. When the poll is taken, what they are doing is giving us a snapshot view of what voters are thinking. And I must say the pollsters are very careful to say that that is not predictive. What you can have happening, I think, in an election campaign is late shifts of opinion, which are not picked up. 
And uh, in the hurly-burly of an election campaign, it is quite possible for quite significant shifts of opinion to occur, which the polls necessarily are not showing. Uh, I think the best example of that would be what happened in 1970 in the British general election. Everybody was predicting Labour would hang on under Harold Wilson. There was a marked shift of opinion. The Tories surged ahead. That was simply not picked up by the public opinion polls. Many of the pundits, many of the commentators were caught flat-footed by that. So the two things are it's a snapshot picture of what opinion is saying. Secondly, we look at the polls to show a trend over time in terms of what that can tell us. You've raised a couple of interesting points there. First of all, you haven't uh, mentioned the New Zealand situation where the, the pundits and the polls have been wrong before. Well, I think the polls are improving. I think perhaps in the case of Halen, social credit consistently has said that that discriminates against them because they don't poll below a certain level of population centre. And that is true because social credit has been strong in some of those smaller centres. I think over time, you compare both the main polls, NRB and Halen, we do get a fairly accurate picture. One quick final question, uh, uh, Rod Alley. Uh, is there a danger that public opinion polls could in fact lead public opinion? Well, this point is often made, but I think it cancels out because on the one hand, uh, the public that is going to be swayed by the fact that a party seems to be in front, may, that, that factor may very well be cancelled out by the fact that the party that is behind then galvanises its forces into action, they work harder, they say to themselves, look, we're behind, we better work harder. I tend to think that uh, after a period of time, and polls have now been with us for some time, uh, the public is fairly uh, sceptical as to whether or not these things really do influence right. what they... Well, I know that you're as interested as any politician in the outcome tonight. We'll be talking to you again Just a little later one on. one point before I go. Very Unlike quick. your other guests who are coming on as part of the panel, I'm not a member of any political party, <laughs> and prospects for joining are not very good. <laughs> OK, thank you, Rod Alley. Well, the vote counting is starting to make, uh, make a bit of progress in its own right, and uh, progress now from Awarua. Here we've got 12% of the estimated vote already counted. There, the sitting MP, uh, Rex Austin, uh, quite comfortably ahead at this stage uh, for National 1181, uh, ahead of Barry Rake for Labour 607, and uh, interesting there to see the way that the New Zealand party is uh, making some, uh, so, some showing there, not a large number of votes at this early stage, but some showing and, in fact, ahead of social credit. In the South Island, uh, social credit has not been strong in the past. This Arua area is one area where they have had some sort of a showing. So there, uh, progress, uh, progress at this stage from Arua, 12% of the vote counted, and Rex Austin in front. Colin James, um, are we really seeing anything significant yet in the election? Not yet. Uh, what, uh, it's normally the smaller booths tend to report first, and therefore... Uh, uh, and they tend in an electorate like Awaru, which was divided between Invercargill and the countryside, they're probably likely to be countryside uh, electorates, uh, booths, and therefore likely to be national favouring. We don't have any indicator booths in yet from uh, Awaru, so we can't offer any particular advice. So I would be cautious about drawing any conclusions from this yet. So Labour's strength in this particular Awaru electorate is in the Invercargill city area, and one would expect that, uh, that those particular booths will declare later. Uh, yes, around about half of the electorate is Invercargill, uh, the southern part of Invercargill and the northern part. It sort of goes around Invercargill and takes a chunk out of the bottom and a chunk out of the top. You add to that the waterside town of Bluff as well. It tends to have a sort of urban feel to it. Colin, thanks. OK, we're Just standing by now to uh, zip down to Christchurch, down into a Labour stronghold, in fact, where uh, one of the characters of the campaign and somebody who's given a lot of pleasure to satirist David McPhail and John Gadby uh, is ready to talk to us. We're going down to Christchurch North and Mike Moore. Good evening, Mike. How are you? Hi. Hi. Well, that's a great response. Are they clapping you or me down there? Down in Lamberger country, uh, Mike, uh, tell us a little bit about your involvement in the campaign. We saw you at the very start, the day after the snap election, uh, rolling up in a truck and meeting David Long. What have you been doing since then? Well, I've been organising the operations room alongside our campaign committee, and uh, we've just uh, been using that and our technology and our information uh, to send that around to the leader and to our team. And... Uh, that's what we've done, and I think we've done it with great uh, skill and success. We have in our organisation some of the most talented uh, people in politics in this country, and uh, their skills have been showing through all week, I mean, three weeks. Mike, how much time have you actually spent in the electorate? It used to be called Papanui, it's now yeah. called Christchurch North. How much time have you spent in your electorate? Well, the polls are closed, I can tell you. Very little this time, and as a person who's been brought up on marginal milk, I feel rather guilty about that, but my people have covered for me for three weeks, 
And really in three weeks I can't convince people some, that I'm something I'm not. And I can't in three weeks uh, convince them that I haven't got the warts I have. So my people have carried me and I'm very grateful to them. They're magnificent. And they have freed me up to uh, work through the campaign in the country, and, but most, mostly, of course, based in uh, Wellington. Have you been in touch with any of the other Labour Party candidates today? What sort of mood are they in? Oh, everyone's feeling extremely good about it. We, uh, everyone knows we have done everything we can, and you don't worry about things you cannot change. The polls are closed. Uh, we've worked on accurate information. We have done everything possible. And uh, I think that you, people are feeling quietly good about that. They know that the Labour Party organisation throughout the country has made great sacrifices, and the leader has performed extremely well, and I think the public just want a change. They've had enough, and they'll show that in the next uh, hour and a half. OK, one final question. Is John Gadsby with you tonight? No, no. Have you got anything you want to say to him if he's watching? No, I just say that there may be, well, a trade post that he could help us with in uh, Chad or Afghanistan or something like that. All right, Mike Moore in Christchurch North. Thank you very much. Another progress now, a very early one, from the uh, North Island seat of Raglan. Raglan at 3% of the estimated vote counted. At this time, the sitting National MP, Simon Upton, a young member of the House, uh, in front, 253 against uh, the Labour vote there, 201. Again, the New Zealand party, in fact, showing up somewhat better than social credit, but very, very early at this stage uh, for Simon Upton. Uh, and uh, East Coast Bays, I think now we've got a predicted result from the computer mm. on East Coast Bays, social credit holding that. Gary Knapp, well, that will be a turn-up for the books because uh, polls a week or so ago were indicating that Mr Knapp might be in some trouble. Uh, maybe we could just ask Colin James at this stage to comment on the predicted result from the computer on East Coast Bays. Well, uh, with any predictions, we make them with a certain degree of trepidation, uh, Fred. Uh, I think uh, your comment on the polls, there was a second poll taken in, in East Coast Bays which had a narrower margin uh, for Murray McCulley, the national candidate, over Gary Knapp, and that perhaps suggested that the, the, na the gap might be closing. Uh, and so, well, if it has closed, then... That's the way our, uh, our prediction has, has read it. Colin, thanks. So that may well explain why we can't get hold of Gary Knapp at the moment. We're back uh, after the commercial break with some uh, more progress results and some more information from Decision 84. Back shortly. Push the whole Rodeo range. Pickups, cab chassis, two and four wheel drives. Rodeo's rugged new two liter engine, ready to deliver a power of work, ready to deliver a power of fun. New Holden Rodeo, very pushy. Experience Rodeo's extra power at your General Motors dealer. Tway, soft, luxurious with a look uniquely its own. Now there's a suede look for walls. Dulux wash and wear vinyl mat. It's beautiful and utterly practical because the unique technology from Dulux makes this matte paint one that won't bruise or mark. Won't shine when you clean it. Wash and wear vinyl mat can cover all your old wallpaper and it comes in a superb range of colours. Wash and wear vinyl mat. It's the suede look paint for walls from Dulux. Welcome to my Caltex Gold service station. It's one of the 120 specially appointed Caltex Gold stations around the country. Our service is slick, exact prices are guaranteed, 
and your lubrication and oil change is professional. The Caltex Gold July Special, a workshop tune-up, plus new champion plugs, plus new Lucas points, plus new car wash brush, all for $39. Only at Caltex Gold, service you'll take a shine to. The team's big day, and wouldn't you know it, the coach has got a cold. But he knows Coldrex will see him through the game. You see, each Coldrex capsule contains hundreds of tiny granules, time to dissolve slowly giving 12 hours sustained relief from head cold miseries. When people are depending on you, you can depend on Coldrex. Coldrex goes on working while you do. Coldrex capsules and tablets, available from chemists everywhere. Welcome back to Decision 84, everybody. While you're away, we have a progress result just come in from Marlborough, an exit where Fred and I are particularly interested, of course, where the sitting member, uh, Doug Kidd, is leading just at the moment... Uh, from George MacDonald, uh, the Labour candidate there. That's with only 8% of the vote counted. Uh, but one of the interesting things there, as Fred just pointed out, is that the New Zealand party has polled 208. It's early stages yet, uh, but Doug Kidd leading in Marlborough. Rangatiki. Uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the electorate we were talking about just before we went to the commercial break. Uh, and uh, after 7% of the vote, a progress result here... Uh, Mr. Beetham is trailing at the moment. Now, that, that goes against what we heard just a moment ago, Fred. Well, it does, but of course we have to emphasise 7% of the vote in. We've no idea at this stage which particular uh, uh, booths are reporting, so we can't say whether these are booths from a part of the electorate which would be expected to favour Mr. Marshall or to favour Mr. Beetham. So 7% of the vote counted. I think we have to say, OK, it's interesting to look at at this stage, but it doesn't really mean a great deal to Dennis us. Dennis Marshall leading Bruce Beetham there in Rangatiki. But we've got an Awarua progress uh, now. If we're going to slip down south down there... Uh, with 22% uh, of the vote counted in Awarua, Rex Austin uh, is leading quite comfortably over Barry Rate. Um, this is our most southern electorate, isn't it, Fred? It, it is yeah. indeed, and it's one in which uh, social credit, as far as the South Island is concerned, uh, has had a presence in the past. OK, thanks, Fred. Uh, well, our studio guest now on Decision 84 is a former president of the uh, Social Credit Political League, uh, George Bryant. We're no relation, although uh, it's uh, nothing personal, George. Uh, that um, result for the progress from Rangatiki, does it tell us anything? I don't think it means much. It probably comes from the... The first results probably come from the outer Rangatiki area, the strong farming area way out in the outbacks. And which would probably favour national anyway. But let's go to the East Coast Bay's progress that we had just before the commercial break. Which, yes, I'm, uh, not, I'm not surprised at that because uh, since I think the Halen poll of not showing nationally ahead 9% probably shook social credit, former social credit voters into action. And since then, there has been another poll done uh, by the organisation themselves, the social credit people, checked independently by a political scientist at Auckland University, and that showed social credit ahead. Of course, Gary Knapp has is is been a very hard worker in the, in the electorate, from what I can uh, gather up there. Deputy leader, excellent candidate, hard worker in the area, and presents a very good image, so I'm not surprised that he should be ahead of the stage. George Bryant, are there other seats uh, that you'd like to pinpoint tonight? I know that Mr Beetham has indicated there are something like a dozen seats where he expects uh, social credit to, uh, to make an impact, but if there are two or three that you'd like to point us towards? Well, I would hope that, uh, first of all, East Coast Bays and uh, Rangatiki, but Pakaranga is the third vital one, it needs only a 3.8% swing there to social credit for Neil Morrison to take that seat. There are only 1,000 votes behind. Now, anything can happen, of course. It depends on the influence of the New Zealand Party and how many social credit votes go to Labour. But that's the next one to watch. The fourth one to watch, I think, is uh, Bay of Islands, where social credit is only 468 votes behind after the boundary changes and the last election. All right, we'll give you four seats to look at tonight, and we'll be talking to you a little later if on, George Bryant. you want a fifth Bryan. one, Waitotara. Have a Waitotara, go. thank you. Some more progress is coming in now. Still early days, but uh, progress from Taranaki. 5% uh, of the vote count there. Maxwell for National comfortably in front, 656. Waters for Labour, 170. Uh, McCready for the New Zealand Party, 91. Kirk, Social Credit, 70. Tasman, a progress from Sir Wallace Rowling's electorate. 9% of the estimated vote count there. And at this stage, uh, National fractionally in front. Maybe we could come back and talk to Sir Wallace uh, a little later about that when we have a bit more of the vote in. But National currently in front in uh, the uh, Labour-held seat of Tasman. 
Selwyn now on the southern borders of Christchurch metropolitan area, a bit of country around it too. Selwyn, Ruth Richardson for National uh, in front there more than comfortably at this stage, but only 10% of the vote counted, so uh, we'll have to wait a little longer before we can confirm that Ruth Richardson has that seat. East Coast Bays now, another progress from East Coast Bays, one which our computer is predicting will be held by social credit. Now with 13% of the estimated vote count in, uh, Gary Knapp there showing up uh, reasonably comfortably ahead, uh, 1239 and Murray McCulley for National 907. Early stages still, but 13% of the vote counted. Waitaki now, a progress result from Waitaki, an estimated 10% of the vote counted there. And of course this is regarded as one of the seats that Labour feel they have to win if they're going to become the government tonight. One that National would of course dearly love to hold on to, to make sure that they don't lose uh, the government benches. Uh, Cabinet Minister Jonathan Elworthy in front now, 837, Labour 597. That's with 10% of the estimated vote count. All right, Fred, uh, we've actually got uh, Jonathan Elworthy down there uh, in Omaru at the Omaru Bridge Club. We're going to have a word with him as he stands by, and having just seen that progress with 10%, what's your immediate reaction, Mr Elworthy? Rodney, uh, we've realised from, from the beginning we've uh, got a battle in this marginal seat. The uh, team have worked extraordinarily hard, and that result is showing up in the figures so far. We're going to hold this seat. Mr Elworthy, what are the issues down there in, uh, in Waitaki? The issues are the national ones. We haven't really been arguing too much about local issues. Uh, my impression, though, is that people in this part of the country haven't been strongly persuaded by the uh, big words and the fancy phrases. They uh, have their, head on, their feet on the ground and uh, they're realists. And uh, it seems to me they're going to stick with the ship. Oh, I didn't see you down there at the public meeting that I was at uh, a couple of weeks ago, Mr Elworthy. How much time have you managed to spend in the electorate? I've been in the electorate every day of the campaign. That particular night I had a very successful meeting away up in Tekapo, Rodney. You may know where that is. We had a huge meeting in the pub up there and uh, th th they are strongly uh, our, our way up that, that end of the electorate. I heard something while I was down in Armaru about the port down there. That has become something of an issue, hasn't it? Well, it was in the past. It was a major issue during the last three-year term, and we had quite a major victory on that one. We persuaded the Ports Authority to allow the harbour to be, uh, to be developed when the cement comes on stream, and so that was a real plus in this electric campaign. All right. Now, I know you've got enough problems down there yourself, but if there's one other seat that you're looking uh, at tonight, what would that be? One other seat apart from this one? Yes. My friend Warren Cooper over the boundary, and he's fine. OK. Thank you very much, Mr Elworthy, down there in, uh, in Omaru in your Waitaki electric. OK. Thank you. Another progress now from uh, an interesting seat in the North Island, the Gisborne seat, a progress from Gisborne with an estimated 5% of the vote counted. Uh, sitting National MP Mr Bell ahead at this stage, 575. Uh, Alan Wallbank, who's uh, making his third attempt on the seat for Labour, 272. Uh, very early days yet, but uh, Mr Bell ahead comfortably after 5% of the vote count in the Gisborne seat, which technically, at least on paper after the boundary changes, is Labour. Fendleton now, the only Christchurch uh, city seat uh, currently held by the government, and Philip Burden there, the government MP, sitting government MP, uh, moderately comfortably ahead at this stage, but only 4% of the vote count. These vote counts at this stage, for most of the seats we're, uh, we're looking at, are still very early, probably only one or two booths in. A Hawke's Bay progress now, 21% uh, of the vote uh, in here, and uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, Sir Richard Harrison, uh, more than 800, no, uh, almost 800, I beg your pardon, in front at this stage of uh, the Labour candidate, Mr Sutton. Uh, quite a reasonable showing there by the New Zealand Party, which uh, we might uh, hopefully be able to discuss with a studio guest fairly soon. Another progress now, and uh, Invercargill, the southern uh, provincial city of Invercargill, there, uh, the Labour candidate, uh, Mr Dougal Soper, marginally in front of the, uh, the sitting MP, Norman Jones. Um, at this early stage, 31% of the vote counted there, though, so it's starting to, uh, starting to look as though that Invercargill seat might be, uh, well, quite a close one, Rodney, for the rest of the evening. Yes, that's a little bit interesting, that, isn't it? Well, we have a chance now to uh, go across to Brett Dumbleton, uh, who's uh, standing by at, uh, uh, well, in Wellington at, um, 
Yes, National indeed. Thanks very much, Fred. Uh, right in the heart of Wellington City, the capital, just across the road from the Town Hall, the Michael Fowler Centre. Here at the National Party headquarters, the atmosphere is really starting to build up now. Perhaps the busiest people so far this evening have been the people putting up those early results on the board here at headquarters, but more and more people now gathered around the television as those early and very interesting results come in. Also here, of course, Party President Sue Wood, to whom we've already spoken this evening. Some of the candidates coming in now, Don Crosby from Miramar and Rosemary Young-Rouse from that uh, highly key marginal of Wellington Central. That'll be one of the seats in which there'll be particular interest here tonight at National Party headquarters. We'll keep you uh, up to date with progress as we see it here. Meanwhile, back to the studio. Uh, thanks, uh, Brett. Uh, well, we're going to go now to, uh, to talk to Jim Greenhoff, who's at the Labour Party headquarters in Wellington. Well, Rodney, things are really starting to buzz here at Labour Party headquarters in Wellington. People came in very restrained, I think like everyone around the country, waiting for results. And then as this room also doubles as the Wellington Central headquarters and results started to go up on the board from the uh, individual polling booths, big roar of uh, approval as most of those results, all of them in fact, I think showed the Labour candidate well ahead. So uh, they're, they're looking quite good for Wellington Central. John Wybrow, the uh, General Secretary of the Labour Party, how do you think you're doing overall? Oh, I'm quite pleased with the early results coming in. It's very early to predict everything yet, but uh, gratified with Wellington Central. We're knocking them to blazes there. And I think uh, in some of the other margins that we're looking for, progress results today, taking into account where the results are coming from, are uh, very encouraging. There seemed to be quite a cheer of support when the Invercargill result went up. Uh, Labour's ahead there too. Yes, yes, that's very encouraging. We expect big things of Dougal Saper. I think he's got uh, Mr Jones done tonight. Mr Wybrow, thanks very much. And this is Jim Greenhoff at the Wellington uh, Labour Party headquarters. Well, the evidence of a few more glasses having been charged there, in the capital at least. Uh, all right, we're going to take a slight break just here. We'll be back in just a moment. Smith & Brown will give you the underlay free. Free Sovereign Foam underlay with every stock carpet purchase $85.95 a metre and over. Choose from New Zealand's largest range. Cotquero Berba, Autumn Elegance, Alcazar Berba, Regal Twist, Morning Cloud, all with free underlay. But be quick. Offer ends Wednesday, 25th of July. Smith & Brown will be pleased you saw us first. Many investments only pay you interest on your savings. Government Life's new VIP investment plan does much more than that. They put my money directly into high-performing investments, like property, shares and industry, as well as government-guaranteed stock. So, I not only earn interest, but I also receive a share of those assets. And as they grow in value, so does my investment. In the first nine months, it grew by over 30% after tax. Government Life VIP investment plan it's turned me into a very smart investor. Now Bill was in a bit of drive. Never built a deck in his life. But the pressure from his beloved wife. You could do it! You could have cut the air with a knife. Knowing placemakers would understand, Bill walks in and says, Fellas, I need a hand. We'll help you do it just the way you planned. Or use a tradesman from our stand. You can do it! You can! Get away! At placemakers, there's nothing to it. You can do it! You can! And we've the finance to help you through it. You can do it. You can do it. I can do it. Of course you can do it. Bill was amazed at what he could do. He certainly impressed a neighbour or two. With placemaker's help, he saw it through. Now the wife wants to build a barbecue. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. At placemaker's, of course you can do it. What's the exciting new dish from Watties that gives you classic tenderness, rich creamy cheese, delicious ham flavor? It's Watties' new Blue Ribbon Cordon Bleu Schnitzel. Just six minutes from freezer to table, also new beef schnitzel. 
How could you make these crisp and golden french fries tastier? These delicious oven chips. These traditional straight cut chips. It must be Watties. You'd make them Watties choice chips. Welcome back to Decision 84. We've just had uh, a message from uh, National Party headquarters in Tamaki that the Prime Minister, Sir Robert Muldoon, has just arrived. Uh, there must be a big crowd there because we're still having difficulty getting our links in place up there, but we do promise you uh, that a little later in the evening we will be bringing you pictures from that. While you're away, we've had a couple of progress results in and uh, we'd like to bring you that uh, news from Rangiora, where 13%... Uh, of the vote counted shows that uh, Jim Gerrard, of course this is the seat that Derek quickly gave up just on the, uh, the uh, announcement of the snap election, Jim Gerrard uh, is holding that seat at the moment for National, uh, Brian Tomlinson the Labour Party candidate and the Bill Gardner, the New Zealand Party uh, candidate there who's made a significant showing for it. Yes indeed, in fact uh, it does seem that um, as much as we can tell at this very early stage that the uh, circumstances of the departure of Mr Quigley don't really seem to have hurt the National case. Uh, too much in Rangiora, but again, 13% of the vote counted. We're not uh, really clear on which booths have declared. They're probably the smaller ones. They may not be giving us an accurate indication of the margin between the parties. Another progress from Hastings this time, uh, and that tells us that... Uh, David, David Butcher, Butcher there, Butcher, 375. Right. Uh, the uh, National Party candidate uh, pushing him reasonably close at this stage, but oh, this is a very, very early count, only 4%. It's probably only one, uh, maybe two booths in. So... Uh, very early in Hastings, but uh, Mr Butcher ahead at this stage. Manurewa, where Roger Douglas uh, is the sitting MP, um, more than comfortably ahead at this stage with 12% of the estimated vote counted. Timaru progress now, where uh, Sir Basil Arthur holds the seat for Labour, but uh, with 11% of the vote counted there, he's trailing. Well, this, of course, is one of the seats where uh, the boundary changes have uh, actually worked against Labour, and there's a, a rural area in the seat now. Uh, one must assume that it's possibly the smaller rural booths which are declaring first, which, uh, which would um, certainly help uh, Mr McTeague. But at the moment, uh, Mr McTeague ahead of sitting Labour MP Sir Basil It's been Arthur. very busy in Timaru, of course. A lot of National Party people have been through Timaru, and they've put a lot of effort into that, haven't they? Yes, and the percentages of the vote there for social credit in the New Zealand Party are a little lower than we've seen elsewhere, which might indicate that where there's a really tight fight by the major parties, the minor parties are All getting right. a little more We've got squeeze. a very interesting progress now from Hamilton West, where Mike Minogue, the uh, man who's well known for his uh, standing up to the Prime Minister, after 30% of the vote there, uh, Trevor Mallard, the Labour Party candidate, is leading Mike Minogue. Now, this was always going to be an interesting seat, and you and I have got differing opinions on this one, Fred. Well, um, it's one of the ones that Colin identified earlier on that we should watch, so certainly with 13% of the vote counted, we ought to be looking at seats like Hamilton West. And uh, there, well, Mike Minogue, uh, a very well-known national figure, at this stage uh, trailing by about 100 votes with 13% of the estimated uh, voting day uh, vote counted. Of course, the imponderable there was whether Mr Minogue's opposition to the Prime Minister was going to help him or, uh, or hinder his uh, election. Night chances. Too early yet, really, to say. Oh, how are you? Now, uh, how are you? Which, of course, is where uh, another uh, national cabinet minister has a fight on his hands, uh, where the New Zealand Party leader Bob Jones is actually standing against him. Uh, Mr. Dunn, the uh, the Labour candidate, in front at this stage uh, by 550, seven percent of the vote count. So it's uh, it's not a lot. Uh, Mr. Templeton has known for some time he's had a fight in his hands here, and it looks as though, on the early votes at least, Mr. Jones seems to be picking up um, very nearly as much as Mr. Templeton. Uh, right, uh, our studio guest now on Decision 84 is somebody who's got a very real uh, interest in that Ahariu progress. It's Mike Bungay, who is the New Zealand Party candidate for Miramar, but your party leader, of course, standing there in Ahariu. What, so far, have you managed to take out of, uh, of tonight's progress results? Well, Ohio is the, uh, <clears throat> one of our main, uh, our main chances of scoring heavily, and, uh, of course, Bob Jones is scoring heavily. Um, overall, the New Zealand Party are, are polling very well indeed. I mean, in most seats, they're burying social credit and they're polling very well indeed, something in, in excess of 10%, I would think. A lot of people have thought that the New Zealand Party has been something of a diversion during the campaign, that it's been very entertaining, but that uh, they wouldn't make any showing at all uh, on election night. How serious are New Zealand Party people about carrying on the fight after tonight? Oh, they're here to stay, and, I mean, there's nothing more certain than that. And what is going to happen tonight is I think the New Zealand Party are going to ensure a, a Labour government by default. And uh, 
I think the, the New Zealand Party are definitely here to stay. All right, Mike Bungie, we've got three progress results. You might be interested in watching this, so we'll be back and talk to you shortly. Well, one progress, first of all, with uh, a lot of interest in it, New Plymouth. Uh, progress from New Plymouth. A lot of the Think Big projects, of course, up there. 16% of the estimated vote count in so far, and the sitting uh, National Cabinet Minister, Tony Friedlander, in front at this stage from Ida Gaskin, uh, New Zealand's mastermind. Uh, so um, we'll, uh, we'll look with considerable interest at this new Plymouth seat uh, through the course of the evening. Again, as, as far as we're able to judge, in seats where there's a real fight between the major parties, the minor parties are getting squeezed a little more than they are in the other seats where the, uh, where the result is more clear. We have a prediction now, a prediction by our computer that Labour will hold Gisborne. Remember that at the moment uh, the sitting MP for Gisborne is Bob Bell, but the um, boundary changes have gone against him. And we are predicting now that Alan Woolbank will hold the seat of Gisborne. Another prediction, Invercargill. Our computer predicts that Invercargill will be held by National. Norman Jones down there. Uh, has held the seat for National since 1975. Our computer prediction that Norman Jones will hold on to Invercargill for National. Marlborough, another prediction here, Doug Kidd. Our computer predicts that Marlborough will be held by Doug Kidd for National. Well, now at this stage, with those predictions in, perhaps we can talk to Colin James and say, on the early stages at this stage, you must be starting to get a few indicator booths in. We're starting to get a few com computer predictions coming through. Uh, where do we actually look as though we're going tonight? Um, well, uh, so far, those are three standstill. Uh, uh, in fact, all of the predictions we've had so far are holding predictions. Um, but one thing, the overall, pr the overall picture does begin to look, with about uh, 40 booths in, it does begin to look as though there is a, a significant swing to Labour across the country. So that's not yet showing up in, uh, in, in predictions for actual seats, but the individual polling booths totaled up that we have in so far indicate a swing towards the opposition, towards Labour. Towards Labour, yes, a significant swing. All right, in fact, we've got the biggest uh, progress uh, result that we've had tonight, with 59% of the vote counted in Awarua. We're going down to New Zealand's southernmost electorate, uh, where uh, Rex Austin is holding a very slender lead with 59% of the vote counted there over Barry Rate. Wellington Central, a progress after 22% of the vote counted there. The sitting member there, Fran Wilde, uh, just uh, comfortably ahead, I suppose, at this stage, but with 22% of the vote in, it's a little difficult to sort of be well, considering, uh, dogmatic about that. considering that this is uh, theoretically one of Labour's most marginal seats, with 22% of the vote counted, uh, Fran Wilde will probably be quite happy to be, uh, to be that far ahead. In fact, we've got a prediction now from yeah. the computer on Wellington Central. Our prediction uh, uh, is that Labour will hold Wellington Central. Glenfield. Uh, I believe we can uh, have a look at a progress for Glenfield. Early days there, they are still not counting uh, quite as fast as they were down in Arwarua, Rodney. No. Uh, Schnauer for National, 630. Keel for Labour, 555. West for the New Zealand Party, 234. And Trubshoe Social Credit, 169. That's with 8% of the vote counted up there in Glenfield. Hamilton East, one of the seats we're particularly keen to follow tonight. Uh, Labour there in front. Uh, Mr Dillon for Labour in front, 1213. Dr Shearer, sitting National uh, MP and Cabinet Minister, of course, behind at this early stage with uh, 880 votes. Uh, still early days, but 14% of the vote counted. It must uh, start to be reasonably significant. So uh, Mr Dillon there, uh, currently heading Dr Ian Shearer. We have a rangatiki progress, Fred, with 22% of the vote counted just there. Dennis Marshall from National is leading the sitting member and leader of the Social Credit Party, Bruce Beetham, with 22% of the vote counted. Uh, Dennis Marshall, about uh, 650 votes ahead at the moment. We have also a progress from West Auckland. West Auckland uh, with 15% of the vote counted, with Jack Elder uh, leading Dale Jones. And there's probably no more um, um, unfortunate... Uh, sitting member than Dale Jones because this seat has really been mucked about for him, hasn't it? Yes, indeed. Uh, this is one of the two seats where sitting MPs actually had the boundaries go against them, so that in theory they were, they were behind before voting started. Um, Dale Jones there saw uh, a majority which uh, has always been rather slim for him slip away so that uh, theoretically this was a Labour seat at the beginning of the evening. 15% of the vote counted Labour ahead in West Auckland. Vale of Islands now, the most northerly seat in the country. 
Estimated vote count of 9% so far there. And Neil Austin uh, for National in front, uh, 5 8 4. Uh, McIntyre for Labour, 3 6 2. Uh, Les Hunter for Social Credit, 3 2 9. This has always been a seat where Social Credit's had a very, uh, very high uh, image and um, not really good news there for Les Hunter at this early stage. Christchurch North, a progress with 17% of the vote counted. Uh, Mike Moore of Labour uh, comfortably in front at this early stage. 17% of the vote counted. Mike Moore in front in Christchurch North. Christchurch Central, uh, progress there with 15% of the vote counted. Uh, the uh, Labour Party Deputy Leader, Jeff Palmer, well in front, 1737, no surprise there. A couple of solicitors there, Tony Willey and uh, uh, Geoffrey Palmer. And back to Colin James now to see what we can predict at this stage. Well, uh, we've now got one third of our uh, indicator booths in, and they're suggesting about a 6% swing to Labour. That would be enough for Labour to form a government. And that seems to be underscored. Uh, our computer is saying that uh, Hawke's Bay and Rangiora, which are seats that need around about that sort of swing to fall, are on the knife edge. So it does begin to look as though there is, a, there is developing a swing to Labour in this election. Colin, thanks. We've got a Miramar progress, Fred, while you've been talking to um, Colin over there. And, uh, of course, Mike Bungie will be paying particular attention to this uh, because this is where he's standing. Uh, and Peter Nielsen, the Labour candidate, uh, is leading at the moment uh, from Don Crosby. Uh, Mike Bungay, I'm sure he'd be heartened by that. Uh, he's made some uh, sort of impact out there, obviously. Uh, and, of course, John Kirk is the... Um, is the wild card there, Mr Kirk, the uh, independent, with just five votes at the moment, after 30% yes. of the vote counted. Pakaranga now, a progress from Pakaranga. Estimated 14% of the vote counted, and this, of course, is a seat which Social Credit's had its eye on for a while. Certainly on the basis of the early count, it seems like uh, their hopes, uh, well, they're, they're still high. Morrison there, the Social Credit candidate, 1182. The sitting MP, Pat Hunt, for National, 834. Uh, the um, a prominent New Zealand Party member there, Grierson, 478, and Williams for Labour, 411. Whangarei, uh, up north, we're heading up there towards Marsden Point country. We have a progress from Whangarei with 7% of the vote counted. It shows us that the sitting member, John Banks, uh, is leading in uh, Whangarei. I don't think there's too much significance about that at the moment, but, of course, Barbara Magna, who'll be remembered by a lot of television viewers uh, around New Zealand, especially up north, uh, is fighting him for his seat up there in Whangarei. After 7% of the vote counted... One, uh, one interesting point there, Rodney, is that Manamotahaki, this is one of the few general seats that they're contesting, and at this early stage, it seems that Manamotahaki is not making any significant impact in Whangarei. Horafanua progress now, estimated vote count at 5%, so still early days there. Uh, sitting MP, Mr Thompson, 617, ahead of Labour's 340. Hastings now a progress with 21% of the vote counted. Uh, Labour's Butcher, David Butcher, sitting there and appears to be moving towards holding the seat, about 700 in front at this stage, with one-fifth of the vote counted. New Plymouth now, progress result, 41% of the vote in. Tony Friedlander still in head, uh, still ahead, about 800 votes ahead. Ida Gaskin, uh, mastermind, I'm told that the bumper stickers up there have changed from Think Big to Think Granny. We'll have to wait and see just exactly how successful that campaign's been. We'll be back after this commercial break. To know Hertz is to know the sheer driving pleasure of advanced models like the brilliant Honda Accord EX with the new 12-valve cross-flow engine offering 25% more power. And to know us is to experience courteous, efficient service. More people going places are discovering the Hertz and Honda Accord EX difference every day. To know us is to love us. Home insulation help just for July. Save $150 on every house out of pink super bats, and you could win this Nissan 1.5 Super C worth over $15,000. See placemakers now for these no risk bats benefits. Just for July, save $150 off every house out of super bats and be in the bat super draw this month only at placemakers. At placemakers, of course, you can do it. 
Welcome back to Decision 84. Uh, Dunedin West now. We have a progress from Dunedin West. Their estimated vote count at this stage, 9%. Mathewson for Labour, 891. Russell for National, 442. McDonnell, Independent Labour. Mr McDonnell, of course, and uh, theoretically is the sitting MP here. And he's got 298 votes at this stage. Colin, uh, any comment that we could make at all about uh, this Dunedin West uh, progress at the moment? Well, I think it indicates that, uh, although it's very early days, we don't, that's not one of our critical seats, so we don't have indicator booths there, but that result, I think, uh, suggested that uh, Dunedin West is likely to stay Labour. Um, and uh, I think probably we can, however, go a bit wider than that, and we can uh, probably at this stage, I think, at the risk of uh, finishing up with egg on our faces later in the evening, we can probably predict a Labour government. Well, we have some more progresses coming through now, and the first of those for the Bay of Islands, with 23% of the vote counted. Neil Austin quite comfortably in front, and uh, interesting there, the way the other three parties are almost level-pegging, Rodney. Uh, it seems that the split of the vote between the other three uh, parties is going to let uh, Neil Austin have a reasonably comfortable majority Yes, of there. course, Social Credit were very keen to do well here, and even the New Zealand Party were, were, were making some noises about this seat, but it does look as though that's, uh, that vote's been split there. Uh, and Mr Austin is going to be the beneficiary of that. Invercargill, another progress, getting uh, well on now in Invercargill. They seem to be able to count quite fast there down in the south. 70% of the estimated vote count. Uh, Mr Jones, Norman Jones, ahead at this, 5802. Labour's Dougal Sober, 5389. Uh, the New Zealand Party, 1097. And Social Credit, 537. Uh, another progress now. North Shore, progress for North Shore with 14% of the vote counted. Uh, Mr Gare there, um, about 300 ahead at this early stage with 14% of the vote counted. Well, now we have a chance to talk to one of the candidates who's sitting uh, right on the edge of a marginal seat, uh, Ozzie Malcolm, back in Auckland in his uh, Eden electorate. Uh, how are things looking now that we're an hour or so into the count? Uh, the trend that seems to be showing up is that in Eden, social credit's collapsing and going to Labour, and the New Zealand Party is just taking a slice off the top that I think is giving Labour a, uh, uh, a head start here in Eden. Uh, you say Labour a head slightly at this stage. Are you, in fact, at the point of conceding the seat? No, not yet, but the trend that's coming through from the booth so far indicates a collapse of social credit to Labour and then the New Zealand Party having a spoiling effect uh, at the other end of the scale. Did you actually anticipate that the New Zealand Party would have this sort of effect for you? No, I don't think that uh, most thinking people took them too seriously because most of the things they've been saying are simply not correct. But apparently that's not true and that some people have taken them seriously and it's doing damage. Well, you're not conceding at this point, so obviously we, uh, we, we don't yet have, uh, have an answer on the seat. Uh, we'll be very keen to come back to you a little later in the evening and see how things are going. Mr. Uh, Mr Malcolm, thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we've in fact got a Selwyn progress here. Before we go to that, we'll take a Selwyn progress with 34% of the vote counted. Uh, we show that uh, Ruth Richardson, in fact, is uh, comfortably holding off the challenge there of the Labour candidate. All right. Uh, we've gone from one very marginal seat that uh, Colin James identified earlier in the evening to another one, to Miramar, where the sitting uh, member for Labour is Peter Nielsen. He's ready to talk to us now. Mr Nielsen, what are the indications for Miramar for you at the moment? If you can hear above the applause there. It's almost as difficult as that night we had in the Beehive on Thursday, uh, but can you... I'll just repeat the question in case you didn't hear. Just exactly what are the indications for you in Miramar at the moment? Have you got any idea what's happening? Well, quite clearly what's happening is that the, um, the vote um, is being split quite clearly in Labour's favour with the um, dribs and drabs being taken by National and the New Zealand Party. Have you got any, um, any idea at all uh, what sort of vote turnout there was in, uh, in your seat today? Well, the indications are that it was a very high turnout on, on our records. And, um, and were the Labour Party responsible for getting a large measure of that vote out? Because I visited the electorate this morning and there were a lot of red rosettes around. You seemed busy. Well, I think we were the only political organisation in the seat on the day and that showed up in the result. The New Zealand Party uh, candidate, Mike Bungay, has been talking to us here in uh, the Decision 84 studio tonight. Uh, have you got any messages for him about uh, the New Zealand Party organisation out there today? Well, I think that um, Mr Bungay's career has been based on uh, convincing 12 people that the government's case isn't sound. 
Uh, he did that successfully, but that didn't translate into votes for his party. We've asked all the people who've appeared on the programme so far what it is they're looking for, which seat they're particularly looking for tonight, apart from your own. Which one are you looking at? I've got particular interest in what's happening in Plymouth because I think it's one of the key indicators of how well Labour's doing and whether we'll have a government that can stay there for some time. All right, in Miramar, Peter Nielsen, thank you very much. Thank you. Coming in now, the vote count is starting to mount. Uh, Manurewa, a progress now from Manurewa. 45% of the vote been counted there uh, on our count. Um, Douglas for Labour, a sitting uh, Labour MP there, one of the senior members of the Labour team, 4368, and Leinster for National, 1890. Jack for New Zealand Party, 857. Uh, Kilford Social Credit, 397. Doesn't look as though Mr Douglas has too much trouble there. West Auckland, one of the interesting seats where uh, Dale Jones is standing. Uh, Mr Elder there, Labour, 4343. And Mr Jones well behind now at this stage with 44% of the vote counted, 3008. Waitaki, 38% of the vote counted, and uh, sitting National Cabinet Minister Jonathan Elworthy still in front, but uh, not by a lot at this stage. It's obviously going to be very close down there, uh, in spite of what Mr Elworthy was telling us a little earlier. It's going to be a lot closer. Of course, it was very close last time, and the New Zealand Party there have taken 670 votes, presumably, away from him. Well, we are not able to say that at this, uh, at this stage. Certainly the social credit vote uh, is not showing up very well at all in Waitaki, so we'll have to analyse that a little later. Kuiper. Now, we've got some interesting uh, candidates here that uh, I don't know whether you want to talk about this, but there's a progress after 13 seats with Lockwood Smith, well-known television personality and local boy made good, uh, leading at the moment after 13% of the vote uh, is counted. This, well, of course, probably the most significant thing here is that social credit is not showing up in seats like Kuiper, which uh, traditionally it has had a big presence in. Uh, so that, uh, that presumably would be helping people like Mr Smith uh, to open up majorities uh, like that at this still quite early stage of the vote. From Kuiper to Capiti, uh, and uh, this was a cliffhanger last time, and it's fairly tight again after 18% of the vote counted there. Uh, the Labour sitting member, uh, Margaret Shields, is just hanging on, but uh, 18%, that's one of those things that we're going to have to wait uh, a lot longer for. We've got a prediction coming up now. Our computer predicts that, in fact, Waitaki, where we saw a progress result just a short while ago showing Jonathan Elworthy marginally in front, our computer predicts on, uh, predicts on the basis of the booths in now that, in fact, Mr Elworthy will lose that seat. Uh, Mr. Mr Elworthy was quite confident earlier on that uh, the things weren't looking too bad for him. Our computer says that Labour will gain Waitaki from National. Jim Sutton to take Labour for Waitaki, a predicted result. A progress now from Pakaranga. 36% of the votes uh, counted in Pakaranga, and very, very close now between Social Credit and the sitting MP, uh, Pat Hunt. Uh, in fact, there's really no, uh, no gap there between them at all with 36% of the vote in. Interesting that the New Zealand Party candidate there, uh, Joe, Grierson. Joe Grierson, there is 1343, a fairly significant showing there, and Labour beaten right down into fourth place in Pakaranga. Well, now back to Colin James, uh, who's been keeping an eye on the computer and looking at those indicator booths which tell us the way the country might go. Colin, anything we can say at this stage that might give us a guide as to the final result for the evening? Well, I think um, with each uh, new set of indicator results that come in, it seems to firm up that prediction we made of a Labour government before. That Waitaki uh, result, our... Um, our indicator booths, we've got four in out of uh, five there, showing about a 4% uh, swing to Labour. Uh, and uh, that would give... Uh, that's well above what it needs uh, to take that seat. Um, we, don't, we don't yet have an, an accurate and detailed uh, uh, prediction for the number of seats that each party will win, but we hope to bring you, bring you that quite soon. Colin, thanks. We're heading north uh, up the country from the capital here at Decision 84 headquarters up to Auckland where Richard Harmon is standing by at the Mungaree Labour Party headquarters. There's no sign of David Longy here yet, but uh, judging from the noise we hear from the crowd every time a Labour result, which shows Labour ahead, comes up on one of the television screens here, there's a loud amount of applause and uh, a lot of cheering, and there's certainly a mood of rising... Um, there's certainly a mood of rising and, and uh, optimism in this headquarters. Now, last election, they had their election night party in David Longy's own house, but such is the interest tonight, of course, now that David Longy is leader of the party, that everybody's here, including international journalists, the Australian television crews, Australian newspaper reporters here tonight. 
So we're still waiting for David Longy here at Mungary, and in the meantime, it's back to the election centre at Avalon. Richard Harmon there uh, among the balloons at Mangere. No red ones. Uh, no red ones, no, no red ones there. Uh, strange that, maybe. Fendleton, a progress uh, report from Fendleton now. 20% of the vote has been counted in Fendleton. The sitting National MP, uh, Philip Burden, 1867. Dobson for Labour, 1602. And uh, Radley for the New Zealand Party, 414. Social credit, only 83 votes so far, with 20% of the vote counted in Fendleton. Uh, well, we're going uh, to another northern uh, headquarters now. We're going to go to East Coast Bays, where Gary Knapp has been facing a very strong challenge, and he's standing by to talk to us. In fact, we're having some problems getting to Gary Knapp, are we? In fact, we're coming to a progress before we go there. We've got a progress from New Plymouth uh, coming back down. An estimated vote count there, 43%. Uh, Mr Dillon for Labour, 3272. Uh, the sitting uh, National MP, Dr Ian Shearer, a Cabinet Minister, 2927. Now, this is one of the seats which uh, Colin James indicated earlier in the evening we ought to pay close attention to. 43% of the vote counted. Uh, Mr Dillon, well ahead of Dr Shearer at this stage. About uh, 350 votes uh, ahead. Sorry, no, not about 350 votes ahead. My maths have slipped a bit. But anyway, ahead at this stage, almost half the votes counted in Hamilton East. Uh, well, in fact, we've got our link with uh, East Coast Bays back, and we are heading north, and we're going to talk to Gary Knapp up there. Hello, Gary Knapp. Uh, welcome to uh, Decision 84. It looks like it's snowing up there. I don't know whether you can uh, hear us, but uh, you're standing in the returning office. Can you tell us exactly what's going on up there? We're having some difficulty hearing from you. Well, we can hear you fine here, Rodney. Um, we're uh, at the courthouse, actually, not at my headquarters, and we uh, have progress so far from 18 of the 26-odd booths, and things are looking comfortable at this stage. What is comfortable for you? Because you're, uh, as, as far as you're concerned, uh, there's a very small margin of comfort that you've been used to up there. So what is comfortable at the moment? Well, more comfortable than we've felt uh, in the last two uh, contests here. Um, as you know, the paper majority was around 300 after the boundaries were redrawn. Uh, we're about 1,000-odd ahead at the moment, and I'm optimistic we might push that out to about 1,500 at the end of the day, but we'll have to wait and see. I strongly suspect you're going to tell me what the answer to this is, but exactly what is the reason for your increased uh, performance up there at the moment? I mean, well, have you I... any idea where the votes have gone to or come from? Well, I think there's a number of factors. Uh, the New Zealand Party has acted as a spoiler as far as the National Party is concerned, but there's more to it than that. I've got an exceptionally good team, and uh, they are performing better than they ever have before on this occasion, led by Chris Hawkins, the campaign manager. He's done a marvellous job. Uh, the East Coast based people, excuse of course. Me, Sorry, excuse me, we have a final result here for you. Would you like to have it? Well, by all means, yes, take over. Uh, I'll uh, read it out if you like. Um, starting with uh, Smythe, the Labour candidate, 1,850. Smiths, the uh, Independent, 43. Phillips, the New Zealand candidate, 1,904. McCulley, the National candidate, 7,459 and NAP, the social credit candidate, 9,500. Could you just be quite clear on that, please, uh, Gary? NAP, okay. what is that? NAP, 9,500. No, sorry, is this a final or a progress you're talking about? This is a final result. This means that Gary Knapp has held his seat in, uh, in East Coast Bays? That's correct. Would you like to give us a smile? By uh, 2,000 votes. You look so very made, serious uh, about it We've made East Coast Bay as a safe social credit seat. All right, Gary Knapp, that's our first final. Uh, you're the first, uh, first result that we've got uh, on behalf of the Decision 84 team. You, you might like to give it, join us down here in the next election. You'd probably take over from us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just happy to prove the, uh, the predictions of a lot of the paper shufflers in uh, some of those uh, universities and... Uh, some of the major newspapers wrong. All right, Gary Knapp, thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. Well, we finally got a smile out of Gary Knapp, or maybe he got the smile out of himself, and, uh, and no wonder. Um, some progress. There's more progress from around the country. New Plymouth first. 69% uh, of the vote has now been counted in New Plymouth, and Tony Friedlander holding on there, 6446. Ida Gaskin, 5586. Horn for New Zealand Party, 1019. McPeak Social Credit, 395. Uh, Janet Roborg, uh, Values, uh, 79. Timaru now, another progress. 28% of the vote counted in Timaru. McTeague for National, still ahead of the sitting Labour MP, Sabaz Latha. Uh, 2614 is against Sabaz Latha's 2365. 
And now maybe a, a word or two from Colin James. What are we seeing now? Well, we're seeing two things. We're seeing, uh, certainly it looks now quite definite, there is a swing from National to Labour across the country. 